Doctor uh, Margaret, good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for holding on. You are trying to log in. This is Let me increase the volume of my mic. I think there's a bit. Okay, Betsy, you can uh, come again, please. Yes, I, I'm saying thank you. We were, was, we were trying to log in and the code was not uh, accepting. We thank you everybody who has uh, logged in today. Good afternoon. We will start, we've started well with the prayers. Then we'll be able to give uh, JB about 40 minutes to tell us about his study. Thereafter, you'll be able to give a discussion of about 15 minutes. Then we shall have a session for question and answer. Thereafter, now we will be able to call on the director of the institute, Professor Mungai, to give a summary on the same. So oh, okay, for okay. now, we would like to ask that uh, JB, if he's ready, if, if he can begin his session uh, for the next 40 minutes, if that's okay with you. Thank you. All right, thank you. JB? Okay, you can hear me? Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So thank you, audience, for coming on time. Today I'll be taking you through this, um, one of my objective, which is the governance of traditional medicine and herbal remedies in the selected parts of Western Kenya. Uh, my supervisors are Dr. Mude and Dr. Kiemo. So the, one, the study findings have been published on the Journal of Ethnobiology and Ethnomedicine. It has uh, been published uh, this year, June, and already has attracted one citation in a journal with an impact factor of 2.5 and a Schimago journal rank of 0 0.775. You can also see other links where you can retrieve the data from. So as a background of the study is that I will be focusing on governance, which can be basically defined as making decisions and executing them. But in this case, with respect to healthcare. Our main focus will be on the traditional medicine markets. And traditional medicine is just a subset of ethno-medicine that comprises of minerals, animal, and plant material that are used for the treatment of human disease, ailments, and conditions. Uh, the interest part of the study is these markets are very close to, um, to hospitals or to where you can easily access modern medicine. But why do we have a surge in interest uh, on traditional medicine even with the access of modern medicine or allopathic medicine uh, in these locations. One thing that pushes people to traditional medicine is the difficulty of using allopathic medicine in the treatment of chronic diseases, ailments, and in that case, as a last resort or as part of long-term management, they consider traditional medicine. Another pushing factor for the practitioners is the source of income for them. They derive their livelihoods from trading with these medicines. Uh, another part which uh, was hanging was there is no, or there is scanty documentation with regard to the nature, the extent, and the magnitude of traditional medicine trade, governance systems, and also these perceptions have not been captured and published. So there is a need to document these perceptions of the major stakeholders, be it the professional um, experts or the local experts. 
But we have so much with us. Are we able to mainstream the traditional medicine in our universal health care, like the way the traditional Chinese medicine is, or the India Ayurveda, Unani, or other naturopathy, homeopathies of India? What do we uh, decide from our laws, policies, and regulatory guidelines? Can they enable us to do that? In this case, I think we need a robust, unambiguous, and cl clear, definitive legislation to ensure that. Um, we have modern governance practices, which I will be focusing on, and then the traditional governance practices on the other side, and see whether the two can be harmonized for the growth of the industry. This started in the pre-independent Kenya with the Witchcraft Act. This was a bad start for Kenya because the law actually slowed the development of traditional medicine by terming the traditional medicine practitioners as witch doctors and being averse to the colonial administration. So the crackdown was, if you are found with charms, then so you are done. Then came the hope that was restored in 78. This hope was that the traditional medicine practitioners, for example, the uh, midwives, the community health workers were now recognized. And since the Alma Ata declaration made sure that healthcare was a right to every human being. Then in 1989 to 1993, the government of Kenya ratified or passed a development plan that recognized traditional medicine as part of the health care. And also to consider the social welfare of these practitioners, their environment, their work environment, and also their registration. Then that was followed by the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which was key in the sharing of these resources and genetic resources and making sure that the communities were brought on board in terms of being asked how they can share the benefits. In 1994, the Kenya National Drug Policy was on board and this one acknowledged traditional medicine as part of our culture, which was massive. In 2005, we had a national policy on traditional medicine and regulation of herbal medicines. This one or considered the concerns of safety, quality, control, and the efficacy of these drugs. Then bang, the 2009, we had the five key objectives of the sessional paper, which focused on regulation, setting up of relevant institutions, role of TM in healthcare services, safety and conservation. That also was followed or succeeded by the Nagoya Protocol of 2010. This one was to build on, was to actually build on the UN Convention of 1992 in terms of sharing benefits. The health bill of 2012, or rather I will generalize all the bills here. All these bills of 2012, 2014, 2015, uh, a bill of 2018 and a bill of 2018 and 19 respectively, basically were to set the agenda for traditional medicine. And in one factor or one aspect was to clearly define traditional medicine medicinal plants and define the role of these healthcare uh, providers in the general healthcare sector. Secondly, it was to consider the standardization part, regulation aspect, and also the formation of committees, uh, authorities, and councils, where traditional medicine practitioners were asked to appoint a representative or two. But the aspect of formation of these councils was a bone of contention because there was a feeling that traditional medicine practitioners 
were underrepresented. Traditional governance practices generally is a function of our culture, and they are deeply rooted in the cultural environments. They are part of our beliefs. They are part of things that drive us in the village and in the social life. In short, for the modern governance practices, the crackdown on rogue practitioners is by the law, but the crackdown on traditional governance practices is the mercy of God, or in this case, or even gods. So uh, I think there is one aspect which is important. For one to practice traditional medicine, you must fulfill the practices of these um, that are set by the communities. So we would rather say that it's a silent but powerful regulator. Even before you meet the modern regulations, you must first satisfy these less documented but less powerful regulations. There is an aspect of our markets, medicine markets. Are they formal? Are they informal? Or do we have a blend of the two? Could we say that our markets are hybrid? And why is that our markets exist affirmatively? It seems that there is a legal lacuna where unregistered products are sold in our markets. Without blinking an eye, you can easily buy a twig, a leaf, or a concoction that does not meet the standards. But on the other side, do we have elite formalization of the practice on paper where the danger we are being drawn is the marginalization of small traders, the elite capture, costly charges, burdening steps, ballooning corruption, and heightened social conflict. And once we have chaos, sexual exploitation also creeps in. The absence of formalization actually precipitates this chaos, whereas the formalization facilitates sharing of the local indigenous and traditional knowledge. But the giant in the house is that, how do we grow traditional medicine with the sheer secrecy and suspicion that it carries? These authors summarized the challenges and the problems afflicting the sector at the moment or currently in Kenya. You would find that one aspect like pharmacovigilance, pharmacovigilance is less observed by the practitioners because they are not empowered to either uh, confirm there is contraindication or there is a drug interaction. Maybe this drug interaction to them is the drug is working. That could be the explanation and you would easily continue with your drug, which has adverse effects. For the IPR, intellectual property rights and biopiracy, this information, outsiders pick them, document them without acknowledging the sources, and also they register those products in other jurisdictions which are not ours. With the parks that come with traditional medicine, then emerge the issue of quarks. Quarks can also easily enter the market. This study fulfills one of my objective of governance. And the question was, what modern and traditional practices governs the trade of TM or traditional medicine in the selected market of Western Kenya? And are they different in these markets? The study was conducted in Western Kenya, which comprised um, of selected seven counties, eight medicine markets, and uh, Kakamega was one of them, Eldoret, Yala, Kitale, Moisbridge, Makutano in Kapenguria, Luanda, and Aror. The sites were purposively selected based on recommendation from the professional experts, following two criteria whether there is a presence of a functional TM market, and two, whether there is a competent practitioner. The secondary data 
was retrieved from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics of 2019 census. And the field coordinates, GPS coordinates, were recorded using a Garmin Autre 20X instrument. By importing the field imported uh, GPS coordinates, you can see a representation of the selected localities. From the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, Kakamega had the largest human population with Elgeo Marakwet having the least. Land area size, West Pokot was top in the chart, whereas the populous Vega County was the least. With the number of households, Kakamega uh, was leading and the least was Elgeo Marakwet. Whereas the number of persons per kilometer, Vega topped the congestion chart, whereas West Pokot was sparsely populated. This study followed a purposive and a competent snowball sampling. This was to ensure that one practitioner referred another practitioner who will refer another one to the study. And since I alluded before, the issue of secrecy and suspicion was so high and hence the relevance of the sampling design. In total, the respondents were 39, 12 professional experts and 27 local experts. I used a semi-structured questionnaire and seeking permission from the respondents, I was able to extract the data. This is a representation of the experts and also the 27 practitioners that were drawn to the study. The data collection was uh, spread across from February to September of 2019, and a host of mixed methods were also exploited for the study. The recording of the respondents we utilize the frequencies, counts, mentions, or the frequency of citations by these practitioners, and then establish the rigor. The language of choice was Swahili, which was later translated to the official language of English. But surprisingly, the dominant local language in the markets drive the enterprise. Surprisingly, also with the cultures, which varies or varied in these seven counties, Eldored proved to be an all-female affair, Kitale, all-male affair, Makutano in West Pokot, all-female affair. The data was processed using Microsoft Excel, where descriptive statistics were performed, and inference statistics, we used a chi-square to establish whether these practices are different in these markets uh, with a Stata software and a version 13. The data was presented in tables, bar graph, column graphs, and a pie chart. So on a sneak a preview of what was happening in the markets, the mean age was of an older um, category of practitioners. This was to show you that this practice is cumulative. It's passed from generation to generation and you accumulate them as you get your life experience. The average years of practice was 25 with females dominating the practice. The major clientele, according to the practitioners, were of the reproductive age and the permission to trade in these markets was pegged at 30 Kenya shillings. But on a sad note, when asked, only 27% were aware of the modern governance practices set for the industry. This industry is not lucrative, as you can see from the monthly earnings, um, mean monthly earnings of TM. Then, there comes other duties or other enterprises that go with it, like sale of calabash beads, candy, 
honey, cigarettes, or snuff tobacco. Descriptively, we would say that there was absolute compliance with the county bylaws because without complying, it means you are thrown off the streets. You will not do your trade. But also, on a sad side, there were no set aside spaces for practicing. Few of them had a certificate of recognition or registration. Few of them had analyzed their products in universities or institutions which are relevant. And then the market locations for this were not established in most of the markets. Inferentially, we would say that these practices were not significantly different in these markets. The chi-square value exceeded the alpha designated value of 5%. Traditional governing practices also on the other hand had captured the conservation and also the cultural aspects like taking care of roots, the main roots, not harvesting a freshly harvested plant or having a close diary. Most of this enterprise is secretive and hence a close diary was key. Inferentially, we would say that they were all not significantly different in these sampled uh, markets. When the practitioners were asked about what drives customers to them, all of them, let's say 62 percentages above 50%, considered it better, faster, and efficient, but a minority said they had no, sim they had no complex dosage prescriptions, they were simply organized and they had no complex labeling. Also, when asked, the trade was passed through the female gender. It was only on few occasions that it was passed to the male gender. When compared with other study findings in this area, women dominated the practice, except in the uh, maybe, let's say, Islamic uh, jurisdictions where women are barred from interacting with male strangers, then male dominate in that aspect. Of, 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 there are needs to have awareness campaigns on the laws, the set laws, policies and regulations. And another part is that we need good laws, not just many laws as we have, but good potent laws. And we should also take care of the over-regulation or under-regulation, and the sector needs complete legitimization and rationalization. Let's see the pictorial representation of these markets. This is Luanda market. This is the most organized markets I surveyed, where it's a shade, shaded place with iron sheet, corrugated iron sheet, and medicine uh, practitioners were given a particular area to ply their trade. This was in Yala, no designated set place. A practitioner looks for a quiet, segregated zone and does her trade. This is in Kakamega, on the streets of Kakamega. But quite interestingly, this practitioner had started to put um, the traditional medicine in medicine packets and do symbol labeling. This is in Moisbridge, on the street, just beside the markets. This is in Eldoret also, outside shops. And my conclusion is that we should harmonize the traditional governance practices with the modern governance practices. And also we should consider ex situ and in situ conservation. To reduce the aspect of suspicion, mistrust, that requires a complete integration. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Chebi, for the wonderful presentation right there. So 
at this time, uh, as uh, Beth told us, uh, we are going to have a general discussion about the whole presentation. And I'm happy to say that uh, um, the work is good. It is very thorough. I'm particularly pleased with the way you covered different legislation and policy documents in regard to traditional medicine and uh, alternative health care. So up to date, what came out from the analysis of the legislation is that, is that up to date we do not have any act that uh, uh, pertaining to traditional medicine. And also we saw that uh, we have several bills that have been there in the past. Uh, we had one uh, of 2010, the traditional medicine and uh, uh, medicine of plant bill of 2010. We have another one of uh, 2019, and maybe it, it would be good to, do, to just explain why, up to date, what has been the challenges or the hindrances that have uh, hindered the, there being an act or a, uh, an act towards traditional medicine and uh, medicinal plants, because what we have currently is uh, that bill of 2019, and uh, having had other bills, even in 2010, uh, what has been the challenges? What is the main factor that have been delaying the, uh, the, the, there being an act uh, up to date? Uh, so that is what I have uh, in regard to that uh, very thorough uh, analysis of the legal and policy documents in regard to traditional medicine and, and uh, medicinal plants up to date. So in regard to the results also, they are very thorough and uh, you compared the adopt both modern governance and the traditional governance across Maybe Catherine can mute her mic so that we can have Catherine. Okay, thank you, thank you for muting, muting your mic. So, uh, thank you very much. So, we are we you compared the adoption of both traditional governance and modern governance across selected markets in Western Kenya. And one thing that maybe was somehow missing because you did uh, that uh, comparison of the difference in adoption of that is the hypothesis. Okay, there is there is a research question, and of course with the objective there. But uh, regarding your chi-square analysis, uh, then maybe you would have expected some hypothesis somewhere. For example, there is no difference between the adoption of traditional governance practices acro across the selected markets. So maybe that one is something that you can look at. Also, something else that maybe I observed with the whole study is that uh, you could have tried to compare the adoption of the uh, traditional governance practices with the adoption of modern governance practices so that if there is significant difference between the adoption of traditional and modern governance practices then maybe we can now look at the reason why would they prefer the traditional governance practices uh, to the modern governance uh, practices that are put in place otherwise uh, the the statistical uh, comparison was robust and i would say generally the whole study is good some of the things that i'm identifying here anyway i would I'd identify the same if, if i was if i were to look at my own study uh, and i think this study is very thorough and a lot of work was put into it and it is one unique study uh, with a lot of importance because there's very little regulation of uh, traditional medicine in place and uh, the quality and standards of this is required, particularly at times like this. Maybe if there was a lot of governance and a lot of follow up on the traditional medicine issues, probably today would have a cure of COVID, who knows? So uh, that is all that I have to say about the whole study. And maybe we can invite some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mag Margaret, for that. We'll now go to the session for question and answer, which uh, I'll request we take five questions. So 
the, uh, if you're not asking your question, please mute your mic. We'll start with the first five. Let's have the first five, kindly. Are there questions for JB? Maybe I can jump in. Yes, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. JB, for that uh, very interesting and uh, scientifically rigorous presentation. Uh, my question is on governance. Um, the title is on the governance of something, something. And uh, what I heard from you is rather descriptive of uh, the traditional aspects, what they do, and the formal aspect, the laws that exist. Um, how did you evaluate governance, uh, you know, Chebi? Because I would have expected some variables um, regarding evaluation of traditional, you know, governance, and which would lead one to have a feel of the the characteristics of that governance, whether it is good, whether it's not good. Uh, maybe I missed something, Jabi. Would you like to elaborate on that? Jabi, kindly go ahead. I think Chebi is muted. I think he has uh, either fall, uh, dropped off. Chebi, can you hear us? OK, I think I muted. <laughs> All right. So professor, <laughs> professor was right, I muted. So what I did here was basically to, to cover the, the, the laws and policies and regulations which were classified as modern governance practices. And then since the study was focusing on perceptions of the formal experts and the local experts, then descriptively and inferentially establishing the rigor or whether these practices are varying in the markets. But I think the aspect of considering um, variables as you've put it and processing in the manner you have suggested, may also be of use to be in incorporated to the thesis, because this was a paper publication. Yes. Uh, that's... And in, in, uh, yes. Carry on fast. Yeah. Yes, and in line with uh, the Margaret uh, Muriuki questions on why we don't have a reliable act to, to date is that there is a feeling of seclusion from the local practitioners that they are not party in the constituting of these bills. And also there is a, a powerful requirement of formal training, which most of these practitioners do not meet. And then the last uh, consideration was the formation of councils of traditional medicine was not representing uh, the local practitioners views and they were underrepresented. All right. Do we have more questions? Uh, JB, I see Cohen is asking what was the choice, what justified the choice of Western Africa, uh, Western Kenya as the study area? That is one. Uh, initially, uh, in, uh, uh, okay. Any other question? Any other question, Basie? 
No, no. Just go on as we wait for the members. Okay. To ask. For the, the the initial consideration was to do a thorough study in Transoya County, but it was felt that one county cannot draw an inference that can be used for the entire part of the country. So it was suggested that we do an entire Western Kenya region because that one can draw some reactions to be uh, considered for the larger part of the country. But again, to compound that, the study used a purposive sampling, which was to justify more why the set side uh, or the sites can be used and the criteria that will be followed on those sites. Yeah, Any other further much. questions? Do you have more questions? JB, I'm not seeing any more questions on the chat. Oh, that will be good to, so that we can end the discussion earlier. <laughs> All right. No, I, 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 I think, JB, the one of the objectives of this webinar is uh, that uh, we learn from people who have carried out research, uh, as we, you, you know, we have learned this afternoon, but also you should benefit from our reactions to your work. So I would urge. Thank the, you, Director. And we have quite a good number of uh, people, 31 at the moment, perhaps there are even more. I think I would urge uh, participants to engage Mr. B with. Okay, comments. there is another question here. Yes. Let me handle uh, Oduma's question. There is um, the, the, the problem of secrecy and suspicion. That one was evident. The practitioners were not, let's say, majority of them were not willing to offer more information on traditional medicine. And the few who offered also could not offer exhaustive information for the fear that you may use their information, patent it, or start your own business. So in this case, I was able to convince a few and then use uh, what we call um, snowball sampling so that they draw in other friends to this uh, study. But this is a major challenge that holds the progress of TM, secrecy and suspicion. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, who is I have speaking? an observation. Uh, Joseph. Yes, I have an observation. Mine is more of an observation and um, maybe yes. some bit of clarity, maybe some, some bit of uh, sharing. I, I've observed yes. from uh, the pictorial, uh, you know, evidence that uh, he gave and most of the practitioners, yes. in my opinion, uh, uh, do their business on the roadside, uh, you know, other than Luanda where we've seen that uh, they are in a, in a shed. Uh, others appear like the, 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 the areas they operate from are not very, very, very uh, attractive. Again, from a uh, study I've seen that uh, the income is pretty low uh, for the practitioners. That, that uh, maybe probably is informed by the partakers of uh, their service. Did you maybe bother to establish why uh, the, the, the partakers appear to be of low, uh, the low income earners? My thought. A uh, very, very interesting uh, observation. I think uh, as we've seen, we have a myriad of laws um, governing this sec sector. But on the ground, they say virtually different. 
So what happens in this case is that the practitioners are in utter state of poverty. They are neglected, they practice their trade on roadsides. And in this case, there could be more than meets the eye. First, I found out that there is no fixed cost of these medicines. And also some of the healing could also be finished after you partake the drugs. So in this case, we would say that it's kind of a treatment by faith where you are told utaniletea, and that one uh, also co uh, contributed more to, to, to the market stagnating. And maybe, maybe the stigma attached to this practice, because you would see it was only dominated by older members of the society, and the younger members of society were few. Hope that would uh, satisfy your uh, observation. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. That's fine, JB. That, that was my concern. So that, that tells me that uh, the, it, it's not well received by the, the, the more knowledgeable people. Would you say so? It is only received by knowledgeable people as a last resort. When you have chronic illnesses like HIV AIDS or when you need it for reproduction, most of the people who have failed to heal by partaking allopathic medicine go to these medicines as an afterthought if they are of the educated segment of the society. All right, JB, you, uh, I saw Jemima wanted to add on to probably her question or make a comment. Jemima? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted to, to add that um, quite often you can overcome the, the cold reception by promising them some feedback or promising them some inclusion in your research in terms of returns. I'm wondering whether you did anything to that effect. Um, the reason why um, these 30 uh, or so practitioners were willing to participate in the study was first, if the information given would be purposively used for research. Two, if you would give a token of appreciation at the end of the survey. And lastly, if you would share or invite them for um, further escalation of this um, study, which uh, we promised. And I think that's what holds the sector because of the suspicion. The suspicion if, is if we give you this invaluable information, would you disappear? Would you just vanish? Then, and hence, most of the practitioners would choose or were not willing to participate in the study because of the past um, experience they've had with researchers. In fact, the only way to do a research of this nature is to say you are a student. But if you say you are a researcher, you will interview nobody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's, uh, all right. There's also a few questions for you, JB. Uh, what informed the components of governance that you prioritized on? And are there other pillars or principles of governance that you may not have addressed? And uh, what components of those pri of governance did you prioritize? Brian also comments that the herbal medicine is illegal in Kenya. Maybe you'll uh, address that. And it's also not commonly accessed by the Mwana Inchi. Then uh, Mr. Langat is also asking, what is the future of traditional medicine in Kenya? Is there a perception on extraction or exploitation of medicinal plants? And what are the recommendations that can be used to protect areas which house these uh, medicinal plants? For the present and future uh, future generations, I see Professor Munga would want to also further ask a question. 
maybe after he has answered those or okay let me tackle those then go to professor mungai the first one was a heated um, preliminary planning of the study whether to do a formal versus informal or whether to go modern versus traditional and i think there was a consensus that we go on a traditional versus uh, modern which were evident um uh, on uh, the herbal medicine being illegal it's not illegal uh, although the witchcraft act of 1925 which slowed the development of traditional medicine has not been repealed i don't know why uh, the only aspect here is that maybe some ejection of confidence in the practice so that it's open it's overt most of the practitioners would practice in their households rather than in the markets but since the study was in the markets that was another angle to the study most uh, researchers have done ethno botany studies which uh, was on the villages but this one was to see uh, with access of modern medicine, why do we have the practice in urban and peri-urban areas? Lastly, the future of traditional medicine in Kenya, we do say we are not uh, bleak, there is a future. If they are integrated and mainstreamed properly, uh, and in that case, um, we would say that uh, the, 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 the local practitioners actually are are conversant about the conservation of these traditional medicine plants. They use their rudimentary conservation strategies, like not harvesting a freshly harvested plant, or not harvesting the same plant twice, or not uprooting a single um, isolated plant. And in that case, we would say uh, they know that this thing is uh, sustainable, but the problem is the stakes are not very high in the markets at the moment. All right, uh, let's have Professor Mungai. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. JB, you are a, a botanist and therefore you are quite conversant with the scientific method, uh, which leads me to ask you the following question. How generalizable are your results? Uh, that, 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 that one. C can we use your conclusions, your recommendations in other parts, uh, other geographic areas of the country or East Africa? Yeah. And then number two, you noted uh, in your presentation some remarkable uh, or significant gender differences uh, in your sampling. How, how do you account for this? Um, first, I think the statistics considered um, were of uh, considerable rigor and they can be used, let's say, for East Africa um, region, but not necessarily the African context because traditional governance practices is a factor of culture and cultures vary. And I would say that since the culture varies, then practices do vary. But on the aspect of modern governance practices, that would be universally applied in the rest parts of Africa. The generalizability part of the data was factored in by the selection of an inferential chi-square value of association, where when the expected um, expected frequencies are more than the set value of five, you consider a chi-square to be robust in that area. But if it's not, you go for the Fisher, uh, Fisher test. Wait a minute, <laughs> Mr. Yes. Uh, if, if there is no randomization, yes. when you're working with your sample, surely how can you generalize your results? Um, you cannot generalize the results using descriptive data, I agree, but you can generalize inferentially. And again, this study could not 
consider randomization because it's a targeted study. It's a study that bases on reliability of the data and not on the number of respondents. So your study is a case study? It's a targeted study. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> the difference is the quality of data. Once you focus on a quality of data, you disregard randomization. Yes, but the moment you have purposive sampling, yeah, you, yes. do, you do purposive sampling because there is something unique, something interesting in a given area or population, isn't it? Yes. And so that remains a case study. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, how about the gender differences? Oh, so I had forgotten to answer your part on the gender. <laughs> the gender differences were remarkable based on the cultures in these markets. But again, since the data was processed as a global data, then you would see there were no differences. But if you would base it on the gender variation, it's a factor of culture. In, uh, for example, a market of Makutano, as I indicated, mm -hmm. it was an all female affair. But when you go to a market like Akamega, or let's say Kitale is an all male affair, then you would say further interrogation of this is that why do we have males dominating other markets and females dominating other markets? But globally, the traditional medicine knowledge is passed through the female gender, mostly mm. through the female gender. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there more questions for Jebi? Thank you, Jebi, Professor Mungai. I see Sheila has uh, commented that your study will be very important and it's, when the study sinks in, we will be able to appreciate it and have a market for it. Are there more questions for Jebi? Can I answer also, one question here? For Mr. Karuki, who has asked you whether the Witch yeah. Act, uh, Act has been uh, repealed. The Witchcraft yes. Act is still existing, and it's really a sad affair or a sad story that this uh, has not been repealed. But it's timely that we repeal this Act. Do you have any more questions for you? For JB? JB? Yes. Lillian? Yeah, sorry, sorry I joined in late mm -hmm. in another training and I missed uh, basically everything. But uh, JB, maybe I don't know whether you've already shared about any possible because I'm sure, as you had mentioned, there are lots of other research in this particular area, but is there any gap? You what will you um, recommend like an area for further interrogation? And then with the rapid um, development and urbanization, migration from the rural to the urban areas, um, where do you see, because uh, I anticipate that maybe the youth, most of them are moving to urban areas for greener pasture. Where do you see the feature of uh, this particular field? Uh, uh, traditional hubs and all that in terms of maybe knowledge and all that how what are we going to do to make sure that maybe don't run uh, out of the knowledge among the population because um, I believe that maybe it is within the older generation and very soon uh, we shall be having like it is eroding Can you comment please yeah, so uh, that is a, a question which is similar to Kiprono Lagat's question. I would say the future is not that bleak if we support the current practitioners and we also uh, consider them uh, as part of the primary health care. And then also by creating an act which is not uh, in existence at the moment, all these bills have stagnated over a decade and they are not listening to the voices of the local practitioners or the local practitioners are being neglected. So with this, the stakes are very low. The older generation are practicing it and the younger generation are moving away from it. 
then if we document, we can capture most of this information. And if the boat is not rescued from sinking, then we would say there is a danger. All right, thank you, Jabi. Do you have any more questions for Jabi? Margaret? Okay, I I have more one more, maybe just an observation, or maybe I can call it a question. Because uh, if you look at the 1925 uh, Witchcraft Act, uh, rules are supposed to either enable, sometimes rules enable action, they are there to enable action, but at times also rules disable action or they hinder the possibility of action uh, taking place towards the right direction. So maybe Chebi could tell us how he feels the 1925 Witchcraft Act has disabled the traditional medicine in Kenya. Since the act is uh, active, it means that it can be used anytime uh, if the present jurisdiction is not, uh, let's say, favoring a practice, or if there are some interests in the market with imported traditional medicine or any other conflict, then they can kick in uh, that act. Uh, but again, the act was majorly to safeguard the colonial government and administration. Uh, but I don't think the current administration has um, any kind of uh, colonial uh, trampling on the population. So, but it's time the act is repealed. I don't know why it has taken so many years not to discard that act. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jebi. Um, I see Lillian would like to ask a question. Yes, maybe just a comment or something for consideration. I've been following up, I'm currently following up on particular research. I see Professor uh, Magat is one of them about mediating um, household energy, transition to household energy, uh, something to do with mediation. So I'm thinking probably those are some of the um, uh, alternatives, approaches that we should be embracing if we feel that really we have research, we have a good recommendation to policymakers, nothing much is being done to kind of uh, impress the traditional medicine. So I'm thinking this is one of the areas that we could also consider starting to mediate between different stakeholders to ensure that we keep this uh, very important uh, uh, traditional medicine or field, um, yeah, profitable to the nation. All right, thank you, JB. Is uh, let me react to that. Uh, I think that's where um, mediation comes in, because the the stagnation of these bills, parliamentary bills, into an act, is because of the conflicts that exist between the regulators, the formal regulators, and the informal players. So the total disregard of the contribution of the least educated as it's put, who are driving this sector is the major source of conflict. And also now the fighting back of the practitioners by not giving any information. And they would rather die with it if there is no uh, governance uh, uh, solution or a political blessing. So I think that's where mediation kicks in, uh, rather than just uh, us considering the governance uh, quagmire we should also consider the mediation solution. All right, thank you, JB. Um, could I ask, or ask you a question? Uh, pegged on the fact that the herbal medicine is associated with witchcraft, how would we change the perception so that we are able to see the benefits of herbal medicine and uh, the second question is, how will your study inform policy so that we change or we enact this, uh, we ensure that the repeal of the Witchcraft Act is done immediately so that we see the benefits, we, we get to benefit from the act? 
Um, very good question. With the study findings, um, which I think uh, will be shared with uh, most of those respondents who actually drive the sector, most of them were professional experts in this sector based at the uh, Department of Culture and others in the Department, let's say, Ministry of Health. So it's, and most of them were also part of this uh, uh, constituting team of these bills. And it's, it will contribute to a policy that would solve this um, uh, stagnation, uh, retardation of knowledge in medicine. Another thing is that although um, this medicine is cure, there, is, uh, there are no empirical uh, studies or funded research to document each or the common uh, traditional medicine that um, can be further uh, processed, registered, and licensed. So I think that's an avenue that should be considered. And finally, the standardization of the process. And also we consider part of uh, Nagoya protocol of uh, sharing benefits. I think that's what's holding down uh, the trickling or the sharing of the information uh, within uh, or between stakeholders. Thank you very much, JB. Do we have more JB. questions for JB? Yes, yes, one more. All right. But uh, maybe maybe this is yes, out Joseph? of uh, slightly out of uh, your area of of interest, but just an observation. The, are they classified? Say, like like in Luanda, I've seen uh, they are in a shed, and there are quite a number of them. Do, do we have some who who are rated higher than the others? In, in any way, or they are seen as more, 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 more what now? You know, more, more popular because of their expertise. Uh, what I saw from uh, the Luanda market is that it's a very organized traditional medicine um, practitioner um, kind of uh, arrangement where they have a representation. Uh, before you interview the members, you have to see the chairman. Uh, although most of the traders were female, uh, surprisingly the leader was a male. That tells you about the patriarchal nature of our society. And again, you would be told, ask the chairman, whether I can give you this information, then the chairman would permit the sharing of the information. So the sitting arrangement, um, normally, normally the sitting arrangement will be, you should know your spot in the market. And once you know your spot in the market, uh, then, then you practice from that spot. But again, the issue of ranking and superiority could easily be seen because the chairman enjoys some respect other than the rest of the members. And in that case, you would say that uh, there is a sense of, uh, there is a sense of ranking, which is silent, but not conspicuous. All right. Thank you, Jabi. Is there any, are there more any questions for JB? Kamugisha, would you want to ask? Okay. There being no more questions for JB. We, I would now like to call on the director of the institute, Professor, Mung Professor Mungai, so that he gives us his view on this particular webinar. Professor Mungai. Thank you very much, Dr. Kathambi. I would like to first of all thank uh, the speaker for this afternoon, uh, Mr. Willy Chebi, for a very interesting and informative uh, presentation and for giving a good example to our PhD uh, students with respect to pub publishing. We publish an article in a journal that uh, looks quite uh, credible 
and uh, we look forward to receiving yet another paper on your other uh, objectives. So well done. I would like to, um, before I thank the participants, I think you have received uh, some very useful comments, especially on the aspect of governance, because listening to you, you, you have uh, tackled a number of <clears throat> governance issues. Uh, if people are organized into groups, the, you know, the traditional, you know, healers, uh, people dealing with traditional medicine, if they are organized into groups, how are they organized? I saw at one point you are talking about even elite capital uh, in that particular field. So that's a governance issue, which is measurable. Uh, you've talked about um, the development of laws, policies and laws regarding this particular field. How are the policies and how are the laws developed? Are they participatory enough? Because uh, participation is one of uh, the you know, elements of uh, governance, good governance. And uh, there is also the issue of uh, um, information, <clears throat> information asymmetry. You have talked about it. Uh, the question would be whether you measured that uh, so that uh, it, it becomes part of you know your your thesis. So I think you will need to. I haven't seen we haven't seen the whole thesis, but uh, this is only one aspect. It's one paper, one objective. But I think when you are doing the thesis. It will be important to show the elements of governance and how they were measured and the outcomes of that. So uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants. The attendance was quite good, and I think it has been fairly um, uh, you know, active, uh, people commenting or asking uh, you know, questions. So I want to thank all the participants this afternoon. Please keep coming. We'll be having another webinar next week, I think for an MSc, and that will be followed by another for a PhD a student. And I will keep it up that way until the end of the year. So you are all invited and we appreciate seeing you in our webinars. Your contributions to the speakers are invaluable. And uh, Dr. Bessie, thank you for the organization. And uh, Madam Morioki, thank you for being a discussant in this afternoon's uh, webinar. So with that, I say thank you all and have a nice um, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I would request if we could have a word of prayer by Madam Margaret, who has been a wonderful discussant and also helping me with moderating. Thank you very much, Margaret. Please say a word of prayer for us as we conclude. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Thank you also, Prof, and the presenter, Chebi. We are going to pray uh, to say a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We glorify your holy name, O Father. Thank you for bringing us all together this afternoon. We glorify your name for all the all the discussions that you have had here, God. And we pray that may you help Chebi as he puts our contributions towards his work, O God. We also pray for all other postgraduate students as we prepare our work for future presentations like this, O oh God. We pray that you be with us. We also pray for Wagari Mother Institute, that you may continue prospering the institute. For it is in the name of Jesus that we pray, trust, and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Good evening.